So, hello everyone. How are you doing today? Show some energy. It's the morning. <laughs> okay, so let's begin. Hi everyone, I'm Maria, and I'm here to talk about the big piece of the new Postlam Pie. If you haven't guessed already, I'm a big foodie, and I love all sorts of pies, and pizzas are my favorite one. Apple pie as well. Well, yeah, that's the picture over there. So what's the biggest piece of the new Postlam Pie? We'll find that out in a bit when I'm going to dig deeper into it. But first, a bit about myself. So I completed my education from Rochester Institute of Technology. It's in upstate New York. It snows quite a bit there. And I worked in software engineering and product development positions before. I currently work at Ericsson's Stockholm office, and contrary to popular belief, I love the weather there. And um, that's the boring part, right? The mundane stuff. The interesting bit is that I'm from Pakistan, and um, I also lead an initiative called Stemming from Her, which aims to empower women and bridge the gender gap in STEM fields over there. And I do this through awareness workshops and field trips and mentorship programs. I'm also a passionate conference speaker, and I've spoken at other tech conferences before. But today, at JS Congress in particular, I'm choosing to talk about this particular topic, the Postline Pie, because of a very particular reason. It's actually a personal story of mine that I would like to share with you all, so bear with me. I want you all to take a look at this picture over here and particularly observe the black box. Now, black box, that's how things actually looked for me in 2012, when I actually joined my first job in 2012 as a software engineer at a software company back in Lahore, Pakistan. And if you replace this machine over here with any other server or a client server, that's still how things looked for me, like a monolith packed together. And so I had to patch and continuously update this server all the freaking time, in mornings, in evenings, day in and day out, continuously, even on the weekends sometimes, and I was just starting up, so it was pretty hard for me. And let me tell you, we're not paid over time over there. So there's no notion of getting paid for extra work. So I was doing this all for free. And this was happening because of the unimaginable errors that were actually breaking our production all the time. And I had to do it again and again, until eventually I did quit, right? Well, I didn't quit because of this, but then I quit because of my higher education. But the point is, fast forward in 2019, here are we with breakthrough solutions to these problems, right? We don't, we don't see these kind of problems anymore, at least. And that is because of a breakthrough. Like, traditionally, the software stacks were pretty cut and dry, right? LAMP, WAMP, mean stack, all these were actually a combination of on-site databases and servers and like the Linux operating system, some server-side scripting and frameworks packed together, right? And the productivity that these were enabling actually quickly eclipsed when you took into account the amount of effort it took to maintain these ecosystems. And so a lot of people started the approach towards a more modular stack, and that's where this breakthrough happened. And I'm here to talk about that breakthrough as what we call the revolution in architecture. So now that the problem statement is clear, let us first go through what we're going to be covering today, what we call an overview. So first, I'll be discussing about the change or the shift in the software status quo. How did that revolution actually happen? Why did it happen the way it did? And what were the key sort of drivers in these last past couple of years 
which actually made this shift happen. Then we'll cover the, the freshness of the new Pulse Lamp Pi. After the lamp era, what happened? What are the platforms that are shaking up this landscape? And then we'll talk about how JavaScript as a platform is actually contributed to this Pulse Lamp Pi. How does that as a platform revolutionize the way we look at technology stacks today, the way we build our products today? And then in the end, I'll be sharing resources with you all because I personally do believe that migrating from LAMP as it was for me in my personal journey, it's sort of as much as a technical change as it is a cultural one. So it really, it really takes a, a lot of understanding of different things to apply it to different problem domains and different project specifics. And so you all can go back and incorporate change in your personal and work projects. So the landscape of the software stack. LAMP, like a couple years ago, this monolith LAMP style approach was under question whether that's the best possible route to go or not. And while one would say like anything that's built from ground up should be sturdy and scalable, that wasn't the case. And then companies were starting to migrate data from the server, to the cloud, right? And then they were also opting for more API-driven, streamlined data exchanges. With that, they were also turning to a diverse array of technologies, which were actually quite different than before. Like also, in addition to migrating to the cloud, they were also looking at more scalable ways to build their applications and to combine tools with one another that worked well. And they were doing this in order to make themselves more nimble. Like, you shouldn't be dependent on big stack arch architectures, right? And then we had these new scalable building blocks like Nginx or Amazon EC2 or Relic or Heroku actually stealing the tech scene, as actually tech teams were working towards a more modular stack approach. So that's where all this happened. And there were, there were a few reasons why this happened. First is, of course, related to how we talk about deployment then and now. When companies started opting for more like software as a service solutions, product as a service solutions, or serverless architectures, they actually came up with this idea of continuous deployment. And what is continuous deployment, really? It's actually the ability to deploy continuously, but in chunks. And what does that mean in terms of business? That actually means that you can have shorter concept to mar market cycles. That's much shorter. So from ideation to development, you have much less time as you used to have before. And that's really good for businesses. So continuous deployment, the ability to deploy in chunks continuously, also with these autonomous microservices, not having the risk of one causing the other one to fail, that's pretty good for businesses. So continuous deployment, of course. Companies wanted that. Now, this is closely coupled with why I've put integration right next to it, is because when the cloud came with the advent of the cloud, we actually laid a new foundation for integration. So integration was much simpler than, any, than before, like ever before. So because this was simpler, we have looked at solutions like the Salesforce's integrated SaaS solution. And they work pretty well with each other because they're integrated well with each other. And then, of course, there is scalability. What did organizations do previously when they wanted to scale up, when you suddenly want to test a new feature or you want to anticipate spike in growth? What do you do? If you want to scale up your data processing or ramp up anything, you're actually adding maybe more servers or hardware, and that actually means like more time, spending more space, 
And that means spending more resources. Now what do organizations do? They just go in the cloud and then just, they just purchase more space whenever they want to ramp up the data processing, whenever they want to stop it. So you pay by the month. So it's good in terms of like financial perspective. It's also good in terms of like the overhead that you have to hire like particular ops professionals for something or, or IT people to take care of things. So it's also a less, less overhead in that sense. And then closely coupled with that is, of course, customization. The power to actually swap one component with another without a lot of back-end re-engineering. And that happens today with these autonomous microservices that you see or micro front ends that you can swap out these things without having to cause critical failures or a disruption in service. Now, the next factor is not really a technical breakthrough or a technical factor. It's actually related to what I've put it as the way we generally work in organizations. We work in teams, right? We collaborate with each other. The way it works with like a monolith sort of lamp style approach versus a distributed architecture, like monolith versus autonomy, the way it works is that you have centralized and distributed architectures. And if you're distributing work in a team, it makes more sense to have individual team members sort of work on individual components so that they don't actually interfere with one another or break one another, and they can actually talk to each other, collaborate when it's necessary for their parts to work together. So it's good for team efficiency. OK, now that we've looked at this breakthrough and we're talking about like why did this happen, I have a list up here which are the platforms that are shaking up the landscape, the tech landscape, the stack landscape, which are the pieces of the new Postland pie. And I have JavaScript as the first, not because I'm here at JS Congress, but because you need to think about JavaScript as the replacement of P, which is PHP and LAMP. Because it's so much more than a front-end scripting language now. Then there is um, AWS, the Amazon Web Services. How many of you over here, I just need a show of hands, have used Amazon Web Services suite of products? That's quite a lot. Almost like 70% of the room has sort of used Amazon Web Services suite of products. And that's because the actual range from like analytics to development tools, and you can even do a lot of networking with them, and even IoT now. So you can do a lot with these tools. And then when we're talking about computing platforms, you have Microsoft Azure. That's not far behind as well. And then Amazon EC2, and we're talking about Heroku as well. And with these platforms, the way we also deploy applications changed as well. We started using Docker containers or Kubernetes. And we, we were using Team City, for example, for deployment at one of my workplaces. And we weren't doing that a couple of years ago. So that sort of changed the way we also look at deployment. And then when we talk about databases, of course, Postgres changed the way we look at things now on the DB level. And talking about programming languages, of course, Ruby and Python, alongside Node.js, have actually revolutionized the way we do backend programming now. So how does full-stack JavaScript actually contribute? JavaScript is not only a front-end surplus language, but it's like so much more. It's a stack game changer. It's a front-end, it's the back-end, and thanks to Node.js, it's even like outpacing some mobile technologies. And while client and server architectures were sort of distributed before, they're now more like fluid and homogenous because of JavaScript frameworks. Just look at this picture over here. The amount of possible combinations that you can use for front and JavaScript apart from AngularJS or JS 2.0 frameworks. You can also use like Knockout or React or Vue, for instance, now. Now, when we're talking about backend and databases, with backend server-side JavaScript, it's very common to use Node.js and Express Web Framework. But now we also have combinations of Material or Sales or Restify and Keystone. 
So you have these humongous combinations that you could do, and there's a lot of flexibility. For, depending on your project specifics. And regarding databases, of course, any MongoDB alternative can be used when we're talking about full-stack JavaScript. MySQL, Postgres, CouchDB, Cassandra, all these can be used. It's, they're all applicable still. Now comes the important part, which is what problem does it solve? Like, what are the use cases for it? What particular problem cases or use cases or business cases is this applicable for? Like, when you should be using it. Turns out, when you're talking about full-stack JavaScript, it's, it's really fast and easy to do it. So a lot of companies are actually using it to build MVPs. If you're someone who's starting out by themselves, it's a good idea to use it, because then it's also easy to use, because you're using the same thing on the front end and sort of the back end. So it's, the learning curve is, is a bit low. And uh, not only this. It's also used for other things, like peer-to-peer real-time applications. You could use them for like online chats, platforms, social media platforms, collaborative tools. And then also the buzzwords like IoT and FinTech, like real-time stockbrokers, admin panel dashboards, for instance. You could use them for enterprise web solutions, like conventionally we're using other technologies. Or you could also use them for e-commerce solutions. But it's also important to understand when is it OK to go full stack JavaScript. <laughs> because it's in terms of like the business perspective, you want to do it when you want to do, like not do, actually, dry. How many of you have heard of the term dry? Like, do not repeat yourself principle, right? Quite a lot. So when you want to do a lot of like code reuse in the front and in the back end, and your things in terms of logic and implementation are quite similar to one another, then you would want to use full stack JavaScript. Because then it also enables you to have to use the same templates, the same models, sort of the same libraries, both on the front end and the back end. It also provides like process agility. That's just a fancy way to say that you can develop faster and you can push your features faster. And so with a lot of code reuse, you could actually do process agility as well. And then comes the question of the cost of hiring back-end infrastructure engineers. When you're doing full-stack JavaScript, you really don't need to hire separately for front-end or back-end. You really just do full-stack JavaScript and you're done. And it's good for team efficiency, because then it's the same platform that people are working on. They can really help one another and build things faster. It also turns out that because it's, these frameworks are actually event-driven, they're actually not blocked by I.O., which actually means their performance is quite good as compared to the other backend technologies. That means you're going to finish your development lifecycle faster than other technologies. PayPal actually published a report about this. And we'll come to this number, 35%, that's up here in a bit. But this is how the life cycle looked for them. And according to this report, when they actually migrated from Java to full stack JavaScript, they were able to see that they had an improvement of reducing the average response time per page by 35%. They were also doubling the number of requests, but they were still being able to reduce the response time. Moreover, in this product development lifecycle, they were able to develop twice as fast with lesser number of engineers. So it was like 1.5, they reduced it, and then the development lifecycle, it happened twice as fast as it was before. These were the benefits that they shared. Now we talk about the developer perspective. Yay, I'm a developer. So I like the developer perspective, and I like to work on things with, which have help, like which have communities where I can ask people, where there are huge knowledge bases, where there's talent. And so if I'm stuck with anything, I have a second opinion or third opinion to look at. And then I can make my choices. So with JavaScript, like these frameworks, are backed by giants like Facebook or Google. So it's really rapidly growing community. 
And other than that, these tool sets, most of these projects are actually open source. So if I'm someone who has a startup, and if I'm someone who's starting out by myself, I'm a solopreneur, and I want to build an MVP, it's very easy to start with this because I really don't have to pay extra license fees or um, expensive subscription fees for anything to use the platform itself. Now that we've talked about full stack JavaScript and like the business cases versus the developer perspective that comes into play, we also need to think about like smart usage, right? There are drawbacks of every tool in the tool chain, of course, because everything has a pro and con, right? Nothing is perfect yet, at least. And so majority of these weaknesses are actually occurring only in particular circumstances. One definitely needs to bear this in mind when they're developing. You also, when you're making this migration, need to involve like mean stack engineers or DevOps professionals when you're making this change from legacy architecture to this new architecture. And then, of course, I would say these are relatively younger technologies as compared to like Java or PHP that have been around for a lot of time, especially when it comes to backend, right? So one has a relatively smaller community as compared to these other platforms. So if you're working on a smaller project and you're going to be done in a while, it's pretty okay to use it and not think twice about these things. But if you're working on a long-term project, this is definitely you know, something you need to bear in mind. And that's why a lot of people are creating new libraries or new frameworks for things, because there is so much more left to happen. And then, of course, there's like, if you want to do computation-heavy backend, like if you want to work on machine learning, processing, or algorithms like that, maybe other technologies are more better than JavaScript or Node.js on the backend side then you will want to use maybe another language or another backend technology. And that is because when you're looking at this like in the perspective of like one CPU core, one process, like one thread, and number of requests coming in, it's going to be a lot busy, like really busy. So in that sense, you divide it into smaller pieces, into smaller microservices, and you work with that. And then you can work with Node.js, of course. So monolithic versus having microservices or micro front ends. And with that, I would like to thank you all for being such an amazing audience, for listening to me in the morning. And if you want to ask me any questions, just catch me outside. I'll be here today or during the breaks. And I'll be happy to answer any questions or have a conversation with you. I can even have a conversation about food, because I love food. And, and do reach out to me if you want to arrange like, any workshops for women in tech, because I'm really passionate about them, and I do this quite frequently. So here's like, my email and contact number. And I have some resources. And you don't need to copy them, because I'll be sharing them on my Twitter handle. So you can just take a look at them over there. Thank you, everyone.